Welcome to our last video on the Bill of Rights, where we cover the 8th, 9th, and 10th Amendments. Three of the shorter amendments, so we should be able to make good time here. But before we get started, let's just quickly recap uh, where we've been so far and what we've covered. We began by looking at the First Amendment, the four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and freedom of assembly. We then looked at the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. The Third Amendment, no quartering of troops in citizens' homes. We spent quite a bit of time talking about the Fourth Amendment, your right to privacy involving search warrants. And of course, the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, the rights of the accused. Uh, spent almost an entire video talking about those two amendments. And then finally, the Seventh Amendment, which is really just an extension of the rights of the accused. It applies jury trials to civil cases. So next, let's look at the Eighth Amendment. A pretty short one. Look at this. It's one sentence. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Is that a sentence? I don't know if it's grammatically correct, but there it is the Eighth Amendment, and the key word here is excessive, too much of something. So we don't want to give the government too much power. Of course, that's a big part of the Constitution. How do we limit the government's power, but still give them enough power to get stuff done? In this case, we want to limit the, the power of the government to enact severe punishments on us when it's time for them to you know, deal down a punishment for a crime. So let's break this down a little further. Really, the, the Eighth Amendment is talking about two things, bail and then your punishments. So let's explain bail a little bit. Bail is the money that you give as a guarantee that you're going to show back up for a trial. So if you're put under arrest, chances are your trial is not going to take place for weeks and weeks and weeks. You know, first they have to have a grand jury look at the evidence. We saw that in the uh, Fifth Amendment and decide if there's even enough evidence to put you on trial. And once the grand jury comes back with, let's say they do decide to indict you, which means to officially charge you with a crime, they vote yes, there's enough evidence. Well, then they got to schedule the trial and they got to pick jurors and a judge. And I mean, literally that could take months. So the idea with bail is it's not fair to let a person sit in jail and even even though they may be innocent, right? Because until you're found guilty at trial, you're assumed to be innocent. So we're not going to let people just sit in jail waiting for a trial because you could end up going to jail for two or three months just waiting for the trial for something you didn't do. So bail gives people an opportunity to get out of jail until their trial. So let's just break this right down. You commit a crime. The police gather some evidence. They think you did it. They come to your house. They arrest you. What happens next? They take you to jail. They photograph you. They fingerprint you. And then you sit in jail until you have a bail hearing. A bail hearing is where you go before a judge. The police say, look, this is what we think you did. And the judge looks at you might ask you a couple questions, and then he says, okay, we will let you go if you put up bail. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's say in this case that your crime was like you robbed a bank, so it's a pretty big crime. The judge is going to probably impose a high bail. He's going to say $100,000 bail. What does that mean? It means that if you can come up with $100,000 and give it to the court, they will let you go until it's time for your trial. They will give you your money back if you show up for your trial. So the bail money is there to guarantee that you're going to show up. If you don't show up, they keep the money. Now, most people don't have, say, $100,000 lying around. So this is where bail bondsmen and bounty hunters come into play. Because what you would probably do is go to a bail bondsman. That's a business that uh, they make their money by putting up bail for people who can't afford it. You might go to a bail bondsman and say, look, I got $5,000, that's all I have, but they, they say $100,000 bail. And of course, you're not going there, it's your lawyer, you know, your family member doing it. 
and they would say, okay, we'll, we have $100,000 and we'll put the bail up for you. We'll give that money to the court. And in exchange, you're going to give us $5,000 and you don't get that money back. That's the price you're going to pay for us loaning you the $100,000 to get you temporarily out of jail until your trial. Well, if, if you don't show up for trial, they're going to be out $100,000. So that's where they're going to set the bounty hunter on you to track you down and drag you to jail so they can get their $100,000 back. You know, just wanted to explain that because I know some of you have heard of bounty hunters. So that's how bail works, but bail is, is starting to become a little bit of a thing of the past, at least in certain states, because recently, last, uh, I believe it was 2019, in New York State, they passed a law to get rid of bail for most nonviolent crimes, which means instead of being put in the back of a police car, handcuffed and brought down to jail because you broke into somebody's house, they just give you a ticket. That's it. And say, please show up for court. Now, one of the reasons why this was passed is there were some people who are saying, look, uh, there's certain groups of people, especially people who are poor, who are sitting in jail for months at a time, and they just can't afford the bail, and it's not fair to them. So I guess there's that side of it. But, of course, there were there are other people who said, wait a minute. You're not even going to send people to jail? Like someone broke into my house and I'm going to watch the police just let them go and hope they show up for trial? As you can imagine, it was not a super popular law. And uh, they recently backtracked on that a little bit. They passed another law that started to um, add back to the different list of crimes that bail is still allowed for. But it is the case in New York and other states that there are certain crimes that they will just trust you to come back to jail now or come back to trial. Now, the serious crimes, of course, bail still applies, especially if it's a violent crime, they're going to put up bail. And if it's a really violent crime, you might not get bail at all. Your bail might be no bail because, of course, they're afraid that if you're let go, you might go hurt somebody else. You might not show up for the trial at all. You might leave the country, and then you'll never be punished for the crime. So that is how it works with bail. Now, the death penalty, this is a different topic. Is the death penalty considered to be cruel and unusual punishment? Now, this is one of those hot topics that people like to argue about. Is the death penalty cruel? Because that's the only guidance the Constitution gives us. No cruel or unusual punishments. So what's cruel? What's unusual? Dipping you headfirst into a vat of battery acid? How about the old way of doing things in England where they tied each arm and leg to a different horse and yelled, Giddy up! We can probably all agree that's cruel and unusual, but what about telling a person the exact day and time they will die lock them in a cell to think about it, and then on that day, strap them to a hospital table, stick a needle in their arm, and pump them full of poison. Some of you might say that's cruel, but if they murdered your entire family, maybe not. People debate this, and for good reason. And then there's the biggest problem with the death penalty. There's no taking it back. Uh, we found some new evidence. Someone else did it. Better let him go free. Whoops, we can't. We killed him last November. Get the idea? So who's going to decide this? Who's going to step in when we're trying to decide important constitutional issues? When we're trying to interpret the language of the Bill of Rights and what it means? Who decides if something is cruel and unusual? Yep, I was thinking the same thing. The Supreme Court, right? Except, as it turns out, the Supreme Court gets to decide what they decide. And in this case, the Supreme Court has refused to decide this issue. They have so far refused to make a ruling on the death penalty, which is the same thing as telling the state governments that they get to decide for themselves. And as it stands today, We've got 30 states that have the death penalty. 20 states have gotten rid of it, including New York. So in New York State, the maximum penalty that you can get for a crime is life 
in prison. And this is another example of federalism, where power is shared between state and national governments. And I know what you're thinking, Mr. West, you skipped an amendment. What happened to the Ninth? We'll come back to the Ninth Amendment in a minute. But I wanted to jump to the Tenth because that's really what the Tenth Amendment is all about. The Tenth Amendment says that powers not delegated, not given to the United States government by the Constitution, are given to the state governments. So if the Constitution doesn't say something about a certain topic, I'll give you an example. Education, the Constitution doesn't say anything about the national government having the power over education then it becomes the power of the states to make those decisions for themselves. Now, is the death penalty really um, a federalism topic? Well, the Constitution doesn't say anything specifically about the death penalty. And that seems to be how the Supreme Court has interpreted it. They are not making a decision on the death penalty. And since the Constitution doesn't say anything specific about the death penalty, it just says no cruel or unusual punishments, then the people of each state and the governments in each state get to decide for themselves if that is a punishment that should fit any crime. Now, of course, this does not just apply to the death penalty, nor just to education. It applies to anything that the Constitution is silent about. And this is really a great amendment. If you think back to when the Constitution was fir first written, there were a lot of things that the founding fathers just could not anticipate ever happening. They had no idea that someday we would be flying on planes, that we would be using the internet. There's a whole bunch of things that are part of our society today that they just could not have anticipated or known that they were going to happen. So the Constitution is not super detailed because it couldn't be. They had no idea what the future would hold. But there is this amendment here that gives us some guidance on all those topics that the Constitution says nothing about. And the guidance is it becomes the states that decide and the people who live in those states. Now there's a catch here. And the catch is called the Elastic Clause, which is the last new thing that I'm going to tell you about the Constitution, because this is not in the amendments. This is in the Constitution itself. So the Constitution, it lists all of the things that Congress has control over and the power to do. But at the end of that list, it says, and... Congress has the power to pass whatever laws are necessary and proper to help them carry out their powers. This is sometimes called the Elastic Clause, sometimes called the Necessary and Proper Clause. It's like a rubber band. It allows the Constitution to stretch and be flexible to new situations that they just couldn't think of in 1787. So in my mind, at least, there's a bit of a tug of war going on between this elastic clause that gives the national government extra power and the 10th Amendment that gives the states any powers not listed in the Constitution. But in the end, it gives us a good balance. And that balance is called federalism. Now let's go back to the 9th Amendment to wrap things up maybe the smartest amendment of all. Remember when I called the amendments the whoops we forgot? Well, the Ninth Amendment is the whoops, we might have forgot a bunch of other stuff too. The Ninth Amendment says that just because the Constitution lists certain rights doesn't mean you don't have other rights. For example, the Constitution doesn't say you have the right to skateboard, but that doesn't mean you don't. Constitution doesn't say search warrants apply to your email, but they do. So another great example of the Constitution being flexible and able to change with the times. Thanks for watching that lesson on the 8th, 9th, and 10th Amendments. 
This week I'm going to do things a little bit differently and I'm going to include the activity right in the lesson video. So there will only be one video for you to watch and the one follow-up quiz. And just as a reminder about that quiz, as you're going through first the lesson video and now this activity, as the Ed Puzzle questions come up, you should be paying attention to the correct answers because the follow-up quiz is going to be the same questions. Now this next activity, we're going to review the 10 amendments and I'm going to give you two resources to use here. You can use either resource, you can use both resources, you can try to do this right off the top of your head. It's totally up to you, but I will post this on Google Classroom for you. The resource on the left here is the Bill of Rights in Simplified Language. So it doesn't have the actual text of the Bill of Rights. It just explains what each of the amendments means. That's probably really useful for this activity. It's just a little bit longer because it's an explanation as opposed to the actual text. If you want to use this resource on the right, you don't have to read any of this stuff up here. I just posted it because it has each of the amendments if you follow my cursor here, Amendment 1, Amendment 2, Amendment 3, Amendment 4, and then it will go on to the next page, and it has the actual language of the amendment. So again, you can use either one of these resources, or you can go back to the old videos. That might be a little bit time-consuming. Or, of course, you can always guess, which I know is popular. And also, just so you know, after each court case, you're going to get the Ed Puzzle question. You'll answer that question then it will give you the correct answer. And then after that, I'm going to take a few minutes to explain the correct answer and give you a little bit of additional information. I'm hoping people pay attention to that part. Uh, I realize that some of you may forward, fast forward through that part, but uh, I'd recommend you listen to it because I am going to throw in a few new things that I did not mention when I went over each of the amendments. So let's get started here. I'm going to give you 10 sample court cases. For each court case, you're going to try to decide which of the 10 amendments is most closely connected to the case. And then there will also be a true false question that you should answer based on your knowledge of the Bill of Rights. So let's start with our first court case or our first sample case. A person in a crowded movie theater jumps up and yells bomb is a prank this causes a panic during which several people are trampled by the crowd rushing for the door true or false this person's actions are protected by freedom of speech and they cannot be arrested for yelling bomb and which amendment in the bill of rights is most closely connected to this sample case So the answer here is false. This person's actions are not protected by freedom of speech. And that goes back to the clear and present danger ruling that we saw with the First Amendment, because of course this deals with freedom of speech, it's going to be the First Amendment, where the Supreme Court said your freedom of speech stops when the words that you say present a clear and present danger to others. And in this case, your words... It may be a joke, but they're definitely dangerous and they can lead to harm. Therefore, they would not be protected by freedom of speech. Let's move on to our next case. Sample case number two. Terrorists have been setting off bombs in public places in the Rochester area, leading to many deaths. So far, the police and the FBI have been unable to find out who the terrorists are. In order to catch them, they decide to search everybody's homes one by one for evidence. They arrive at your house or your apartment and demand to search through your personal belongings. True or false, the police are allowed to search your house without permission in this situation. And which amendment in the Bill of Rights would be most closely connected to this case? And the answer is false. Even though this is certainly an emergency situation here in this sample case, uh, and maybe you want to help, 
And of course, you could volunteer to let them search through your belongings so they could eliminate you from their suspect list, but you would not have to because regardless of the situation, under the Bill of Rights in the Fourth Amendment, the FBI, the police, they have to have a good reason to search your house. And in this case, there's no evidence against you. So the police would not be allowed to search your case, or I'm sorry, search your house, because in this situation, in this case, they would never be able to get a search warrant. Sample case number three. The principal of your school decides to search your locker because you hang out with friends who are troublemakers. They search your locker without your permission and find illegal drugs sitting out in plain sight. This evidence is used to convict you of a crime. True or false, school officials can search your locker without asking, and the police can use anything they find to convict you. And which amendment is most closely connected to this case? Well, this is actually true, and this was something we discussed in our video on the Fourth Amendment. Um, or actually, I think this might have been in the follow-up court case assignment that I gave you, the teen court cases. In this situation, they can search your locker, and that's simply because your locker is not your property. It is the school's property. So this would be true. The amendment would be the Fourth Amendment involving searches and what we call searches and seizures. Seizures being like they not only do they search your stuff, they, they confiscate it. They take it as evidence. Now, it would be very different if whatever they found was sitting in your book bag, hidden under your jacket, you know, out of sight. Your book bag is zipped and they open your book bag and start searching through it. In that case, um, I'm not sure that they would need a search warrant, but they would need some sort of reasonable suspicion to uh, give them the right to search through your stuff. And if they did not have that reasonable suspicion, then that evidence would not be used against you. Um, but if they did have reasonable suspicion, and we talked about that, uh, reasonable suspicion for someone who works for the school, like a principal, is enough. That kind of counts as a search warrant. But in this case, it looks like there's no reasonable evidence to search through your things. The locker is okay. Uh, but if it had been in your book bag, I think in this case, any evidence that they found would not be allowed to be used in court. Sample court case number four. A man is arrested and put on trial for the murder of two people. After being found guilty, the judge sentences him to death by lethal injection. Now their lawyers are arguing that the death sentence violates the Bill of Rights and that the man must serve life in prison instead. So true or false, under the Constitution, this man should not be executed, and which amendment is connected to this case? So, unfortunately for this person, the answer is false. The Constitution does not prevent them from being executed. And we saw that in our lesson today, that... Uh, the Supreme Court so far has not made a ruling on the death penalty as it connects to the Eighth Amendment, which says there should be no cruel or unusual punishments. So up to this point in America, it's up to each state. And it looks like this person, uh, unfortunately, was uh, convicted in a state where the death penalty is allowed and they are not going to be able to use the Constitution to save them. Sample court case number five. Due to hundreds of murders in the city, the city of Washington, D.C. decides that guns should not be allowed within the city limits. They pass a law that bans all guns in Washington, making it impossible for a person to legally keep a gun at home for self-defense. Some people are saying that this law is a violation of the Constitution and they are taking their case to the Supreme Court. True or false, according to the Bill of Rights, this law is unconstitutional. It breaks the rules of the Constitution, 
and the city must get rid of this ban on all guns. Well, this is an actual court case. Um, trying to remember the name. I think this goes back to mm, at least, I'd say, 2007, 2008, maybe even before that. Oh, uh, the guy's name was was Richard Heller. He was a security guard in Washington, D.C., and he wanted to keep a gun at home. Why? Because a lot of people get murdered in Washington, D.C., and he felt he needed it for self-defense. But there was a law on the books. It was a city law that said no guns, period, none. And so he sued the government. He sued the city of Washington, D.C. He took them to court because he believed his rights were being violated. And the case went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided that the law was unconstitutional. And as a result, the city of Washington, D.C. had to get rid of that ban on all guns. Now, that didn't mean that they had, they had to allow people to carry guns anywhere, everywhere, in plain sight, machine guns. There were still limitations put on it. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that one of the limitations was you had to apply for a, for a gun permit in the city. You know, you'd have to look that up yourself. But we went over that when we talked about the Bill of Rights, Second Amendment. We saw that there are definitely limitations on gun ownership. But what you can't do is say no guns at all. Sample case number six. A person is arrested and put on trial for murder after being found guilty. I'm sorry, after being found not guilty, new evidence is discovered and they are arrested again. They're put on trial again a second time and this time they are found guilty using this new evidence. However, their lawyer says that they should be freed regardless of what the jury says. True or false, they should be freed based on the Constitution and which amendment is closely connected to this case. Well, they are going to go free, and the reason why is double jeopardy. There is no double jeopardy allowed under the Constitution. Oh, I got a message. Uh, it says, yes, this person should go free. Uh, because the Fifth Amendment says, of course, once you are found not guilty by a jury, you are not guilty forever. The police are not allowed to do exactly what you see here, arrest you again and again and again. And so that's why the police really try to get as much evidence as they can before they put you on trial, because the government gets one shot at it. They cannot give you multiple trials until they decide, until they get the decision that they're looking for. Of course, we saw that the opposite was, was not true, that if someone is found guilty, they may be allowed to have a second trial if there was a problem with their first trial or if they can argue that their rights were violated. I don't want to confuse things here. Uh, in this case, they would be freed uh, because you cannot have a second trial when you are found not guilty. But you should know it is one of your basic rights under our legal system to ask for an appeal if you are found guilty and potentially have a second trial. Okay, sample case number seven. We have an immigrant who is new to this country. They've just been arrested for a crime. They confessed to the crime after being interrogated by the police and before they were given a chance to talk to a lawyer. Now their lawyer says they should be free because they didn't know their rights under the Constitution. True or false, this person should be freed because they did not know their rights. Well, this is true. They are going to go free. And we saw the reason for that is Mr. Ernesto Miranda. And this person, like Mr. Miranda, was not read their rights. And uh, it is a perfectly acceptable argument under the law to say that they didn't know their rights and therefore this confession that they made is not going to be able to be used as evidence. Not only that, uh, but they didn't get a chance to talk to their lawyer. So this 
this case actually spans two different amendments. The Fifth Amendment, your right to remain silent, and your Sixth Amendment, which gives you the right to a lawyer. Now, one other thing I want to throw in here. Um, in this case, this person is an immigrant. It really does not matter whether they are a citizen, whether they are not a citizen. Uh, and I, I don't think it even really matters if they're a, what we call a legal immigrant who entered the country with permission or an illegal immigrant who did not. Because in America, the rights under the Constitution apply to anybody standing on this soil. Those are the rights for everybody under the law. Sample case number eight. You've been charged with a crime. <laughs> seems, seems like a lot of people are being charged with a crime in these sample cases. During your trial, the judge orders you to take the witness stand and answer questions about the crime. The district attorney, that's the lawyer for the government, the person who's he's in charge of trying to get you convicted, then asks you, did you commit the crime or not? Before you can answer, the judge reminds you that if you say that you didn't commit the crime and then you're found guilty, you can also be charged with perjury, lying during a trial, a very serious crime. True or false, you can be forced to answer this question. Well, in this situation, you actually... Wait a minute. Huh. Oh, I read the screen wrong. I thought it said that you can be forced to answer this question. Well, that's false, right? You cannot be forced to answer this question. This is that right to remain silent. The Fifth Amendment, you do not have to answer questions from the police, and you do not have to take the witness stand in a trial if you are the person being put on trial. Now, something I just remembered that I did not mention when we went over the Fifth Amendment and it's very important, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is that you can be forced to answer questions if they are not questions about your crime. So that's called being subpoenaed, by the way. Subpoena, S-U-B-P-O-E-N-A, I believe. It's a legal term. And what that means is if you're a witness to a crime, if you're a witness to some of the circumstances of a crime, the police... And the district attorney can subpoena you. They can force you to come to the court, get on the witness stand, and answer questions. So you cannot refuse to answer questions just because you don't feel like it. Uh, you do have to answer questions if you're called as a witness. But if the answer to your question could get you convicted of a, tri a crime, that is when you say, I'm sorry, I refuse to answer your question based on the Fifth Amendment. I plead the Fifth. So let's say that you are called as a witness in a trial uh, for someone who robbed a bank. And the police didn't know, but like you are actually the getaway driver. And they call you up to the witness stand and start a asking you questions. And uh, maybe one of the questions is, did you know the guy who robbed the bank? Um, did, you, did you meet with that person at any time that day? Well, in that situation, you're probably going to say, um, I plead the fifth. Because if you answer that question truthfully and say, oh, yeah, I know him. He's a buddy of mine. I was sitting in the car outside the bank. Yeah, then you're going to go to jail. And that's the exact situation that the Fifth Amendment is designed to protect you against. So the Fifth Amendment applies when you are the person at risk for going to jail. But if you are simply a witness to a crime, you can be forced to answer questions. Sample case number nine. The president decides he doesn't like skateboarding and that all skateboarding in America should be banned. That means uh, pr like prevented from happening, made illegal. So they're going to make a law that says skateboarding is illegal. A bunch of other boring old guys in Congress agree and the law is passed. Now kids are saying their rights have been violated. Trump, the president, says that they have no right to skateboard, so it's the Supreme Court who will decide. So you tell me the president and Congress can pass a law banning all skateboarding in America? Is that true or is that false? This is a tricky one 
you're really going to want to look at those amendments closely and try to find the one amendment that's most closely connected to this case. Wow, if you got this one right, give yourself a pat on the back. This was the hardest one, I think, because you had to go all the way down to the Ninth Amendment, which uh, says that the people have other rights just because the, the Constitution or the Bill of Rights doesn't list certain rights. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have them. I mean, this would definitely fall into that category. I really believe that if they tried to pass a law saying no skateboarding at all, that somebody would probably sue the government because, uh, you know, you have to look at whether or not laws are reasonable. You know, they can pa probably easily pass a law. In fact, they did in New York State saying uh, fireworks are illegal. A person privately owning firework, a person cannot privately own fireworks. Uh, and I think they could prove that, you know, that's a reasonable law because of the danger involved. Uh, could someone maybe try to take that to court and say that's a Ninth Amendment violation because I do have the right to shoot off fireworks? Well, they could try, but they're not going to get very far. So it really depends on what the government's doing. If they're doing something really unreasonable, it's really restricting a person's freedom. Well, that's when you would call out the Ninth Amendment and say, look, just because it doesn't say I don't have that right, I'm sorry, just because, just because it doesn't say that I have that right in the Constitution doesn't mean that I don't. Okay, our last sample case. A new president is elected who is a Muslim. The president says that Muslims do not receive as much money for their religion as Christians in America because Muslims are a minority in our country. So to make things fair, the president convinces Congress to donate some of the government tax money to Islamic mosques, to their churches. True or false, the president and Congress can do this under the Constitution. Okay, this one's false. Now, uh, a little bit of a tough one because this certainly sounds like it's pretty innocent uh, and sounds like a good thing, right? You want to make things equal and there's certainly nothing wrong with donating money for mosques or churches or synagogues or any other religious institution, except that under the First Amendment, not only do you have freedom of religion, but in this country we have separation of church and state which means the government does not get involved in religion. If they were allowed to do this, some people could see this as the government kind of playing favorites uh, for Muslims. If they're not donate, donating money to Catholic churches, but they are donating money for Islamic mosques, then if you're a Catholic, you're going to say that's unfair. Uh, and the reverse would certainly be true if the government was only favoring one certain religion. Hey, you'd end up like back in Puritan New England where they had laws that you could be hanged if you didn't go to church. So we just, in our country, we have this separation of church and state where the government stays out of religion. Even in this situation where they're helping people, it would probably almost certainly not be considered constitutional under the Bill of Rights.